People always ask me, like, what well, artists inspire your record? And I'm always like, it's always film. There's always like a director that influences it. Even if you're not necessarily tied to one particular religion, but you're a spiritual person, there's something beautiful about the iconography and the imagery. And the space yeah. itself. These cathedrals are built to change your emotional yeah. experience. The church is designed the moment you walk into it to have an effect upon your body and therefore your mind and then your spirit. All my songs always have that kind of like demons, devil, praying, worship kind of like mentality. And kids ask me all the time, like, are you religious? And I'm like, no, not really. It's just a hyperbolized yeah. version of how I feel in like a romantic space. Sure. I love the fact that we're sitting here because what we have is a direct correlation between inspiration. You know, you've got an artist here who's about to release your second album proper, yeah. and we're going to dive in on that because it deserves it. Aww. And then we have an amazing artist here who's clearly inspired you. And we, this whole thing started very informally with you talking about how movies and how directors yeah. inspired you, and you can really hear. In fact, no, you can see Baz and yeah. what you hear I on mean, the record. I met with Baz over breakfast and sat down and I was like shaking the whole time and I was like, okay. After the record was well, finished? No, well, I, I, was, I was in it. the middle of yeah. it, yeah. And I just started writing like video treatments and that's when it kind of like, because the thing is, is I had been so obsessed with Romeo and Juliet with mm -hmm. his with his film and I had watched it over and over and over again. I was going through this really bad breakup, you this prolonged yeah. breakup, this mm -hmm. like toxic mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. Break up, and I was like so obsessed with Romeo and Juliet, and I didn't make the correlation as to I was loved the film because of what was happening in my real life. Life imitates art, mm -hmm, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so then one day I realized, as I was like getting to like the thick of the, the rising action of the record, you know what I mean, the moment where I'm realizing that the the love is do is is doomed, you know what I mean, this like forsaken mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I realized that that's why I was so obsessed with the film is because I felt like I was living it, you know and just spoke to me so much. So when I sat down, we sat down over breakfast and I was like, I'm making this record and it's like yeah. really influenced by you and I'm borrowing some things and I'm reinterpreting them <laughs> and I just hope that's okay. And uh, From my point of view, I am only um, honored and moved and excited for you. I, was, I mean, it was a great yeah. long, 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 it, it started at breakfast, it probably went into lunch. We had like a dinner. three hour brunch. It yeah. but it was, and it was great <laughs> because what the connection was, was uh, the recognition is, is that like I borrow or I was influenced on Romeo and Juliet. That whole film yeah. is made yeah. up of references to other movies and references in the world of popular culture and classical references. Yeah. So it's just handing on the baton. And the fact that it in any way has a value to inspire someone else to connect with the story, to dig the story. 20 years later. That's, yeah. you know, I'm honored by but that. But I have to say though, Horsey, it's a very, very direct like connection to you as an artist and I wonder actually when I'm listening to this concept I'm going to ask you directly what the concept's mm -hmm. about in a second but when I'm listening to it you've invented this world but I wonder whether or not it's just in your head yeah whether or not these characters are just kind of you and it's all very kind of like for me when I'm making a record like making a concept record the concept really lies in the in the sonics and in the visuals the lyrics are usually pretty on the nose mm -hmm. with Hopeless Found Kingdom like for me it was like you know when you're, when you're a kid and you climb a tree and you know you get to the top of the tree smash cut to like daydream where you're like on top of a mountain and there's like clouds mm. underneath you and you're looking mm. around and you mm. have a superhero cape on and it's like that's what this record is for me is this like hyperbolized like smash cut fantasy Halsey cinematic universe mm. like interpretation of this like very human very normal relationship I went through and so me amplifying it into this like into this like uh, parallel universe, mm, like mm, afterlife, sure, you know, sure. forsaken love story, mm. is me trying to show everyone just how it felt to me in the moment. Because even wow. though it was just a normal yeah. breakup, it yeah. felt like the end of the world. Yeah. It yeah. felt like paranormal. Yeah, you know. So that's why why I kind of why I amplified it in Steroids. that way. Steroids. Yeah. But you don't want to have to be explaining it for the next year, right? In some ways, you want to be able to let it go and find yeah. its audience and do what it's supposed to do and live its life. I think I'm done explaining things, though, which I feel like I really had to do in the beginning. Yeah, maybe. Because you, I, it was yeah. my first record, and I was just like, you know, just wanting to prove to everybody all the time that what I was doing was in good faith and was truly artistic. Because I'm also a 22 year old girl, and like, you know, mm. there's so many parts of my career that are like, you know, in, in fashion or in pop culture and like, you know, who, who I'm hanging out with or whatever. And it kind of discredits me as an artist sometimes. Sometimes and mm. people just want to like brush off the fact that I wrote an entire record myself and all that It's so funny how quickly all that can be taken away when you're seen in public with Justin Bieber Do you ever find yourself when you're working on a film mm. and you stakes is high? I mean, let's be honest. I mean strictly, you know, Romeo and Juliet, Moulin Rouge, you know You're, mm. you're interpreting some classic stories. You mean these low-budget independent movies? Like <laughs> <that>? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, do you ever, does it ever cross your mind in that process, and I'm sure you're trying to stay in that moment, that, that you know, what is the interpretation of this going to be? And because, you know, these are tales and, and things that are precious to people before you even get your hands on them. I mean, making a film is like painting a picture with 300 people, so I work mm. with a vast collaboration. Yeah. But early on, early on, the initial emotional need of the piece is something that's got, that, I, that I'm personally struggling with or wrestling with, mm -hmm. which is interesting that Romeo and Juliet 20 years ago or, or have recently dealt yeah. with. Mm. So then it becomes about finding codes and language mm. that are to release the big idea and engage emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then you have this third thing, which I think you're alluding to, because when you came to me at the Chateau, you were telling the story of it. What was really interesting, and I, it's up for you to say what parts of that you want to reveal, mm -hmm. but the intersection between experiencing that film and your own personal life, mm -hmm. and bringing those two things together is what then is, makes it resonate. It yeah. gives you this kind of resonance, which is what's in the album. What was your first impression of listening to the record once you finally got to hear it? There's some very, very direct things about it in its connection to Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. and remember, I'm reminding everyone, I didn't, I decoded the essence of that story, and so did Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. You know, it always existed. So what I got from it very directly was what you first spoke to me about in the Chateau, yeah. which is this, intersection between a very personal record that is very you mm -hmm. that's you it's not you talk about what you think mm -hmm. i get a lot from it, what you also feel yeah and that intersection with this iconic story and a personal cinematic experience when you were young mm -hmm. younger that has never been able to leave you and that's happened to me i mean apocalypse now yeah you would not think but that's a film that affected me so profoundly and i've seen it so many times the experience of that film changes as you grow, yeah. the means of it changes you. Yeah. So that's what I got. You, I think, litter your movies with, with things that mm -hmm. we're supposed to discover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they are meant, they are made in a certain language. Yeah. They're not meant to be viewed once. Yeah. They're made in layers and they are meant and are actually seen over and over again. Are there yeah. things that people still haven't discovered in certain films? I don't think anyone's discover that the crew is standing in the middle of the final scene of Romeo and Juliet, right in the middle of the screen. But I don't, I don't mention Is that, that an exclusive? Happened. It's just between us, okay, in the final scene. Because the action in the foreground, there are no visual effects in those days, the action in the foreground is so strong, the crew is standing right in the middle doing this. Uh, no one seems to notice. But the devil's in the detail and you're, you're having fun with this and it's interesting because if you were doing that subconsciously on Badlands, now you're, yeah. I think you're doing it very consciously on this record and I feel in like, way, yeah. I feel like you're, you're setting your audience on a treasure hunt in some respects and yeah. there's, there's a lot of little you know, weaves and twists and turns in this project already the way that you're even just releasing it. Yeah. Like, you know, putting the newspapers on people's front doorsteps. You We've know? definitely like, taken on some like really gorilla like type marketing tactics mm. because like you know it's a hard world out here for someone who makes a concept album mm. we live in a world of singles you know yeah. what i mean so like mm -hmm. it's a, it's a hard world out here for me trying to be like hey consume my thing as a as a complete body of work in, in no other way you it's know certainly I mean? not the kind like, of behavior from someone who had the biggest hit of 2016. i think a lot of people are looking at that like you know what here's 12 really perfectly constructed pop songs in a row i'm going to capitalize on this following a hit ain't easy it's, no. it's hard to stay true when you have a hit yeah I, I think also so though, like the, what the hit showed me though was nothing changed when mm. Closer was a number one record. Mm. Nothing changed. More people didn't come up to me on the street. I didn't like you know. No, I didn't become a different person. I didn't wake up in the sure. morning and my skin was clear yeah, and like you know yeah, water yeah, tasted yeah. better. Like nothing changed for me. I just got a whole lot more Snapchats of people singing the song <laughs> yeah. in the in the car or like drunk in bars. Mm. So what I learned was like I can I can you know make art that I feel is authentic or I can make art that is. Not that Closer was, is inauthentic, but you know, I think that chasing a formula is inauthentic if I chase the formula of Closer over and over cool. and over I think again. It's cool. Like I said before, yeah. I think you have an opportunity to be a part time pop star. And you can dip your toe in when you want. Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting. Know. You know, it's like, yeah. I can go and do this thing with Justin, or I can do this thing with Chain Smokers, but when I'm Halsey and when I'm making a record, Baz Luhrmann. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know well, I mean? well, well, well. Yeah. No. Uh, but you know what? I think you bring up a really important point because. You can also, it can also be precarious chasing hits. Yeah. It can be precarious, absolutely. We all go through it. What happens to the nourishment of your soul, soul. or the thing that, that, that actually got yeah. you in the first place? Like what, what yeah. and, and you know what, in any grand career, there are those full of hits, there are, there are those albums or movies that may be less popular in a certain year, but they've obviously nourished the journey mm -hmm. and people look back at them. I mean, whether it's a Bowie and Lowe or whatever it is, 
you look back at them and you go, well, you take that out of there, mm -hmm. the, the rest of the journey would have fallen. Because yeah. eventually chasing hits will end up, yeah. you know, there'll be, enough, it'll be you know, bad repetitive things that have no soul. What does it feel like when you have a hit, Baz? When you have a hit movie on your hands or a hit show on your hands and you know, and you know it's caught fire, what does it feel like? It feels like a wedding that never ends. Everyone's going like, it must be fantastic. Yeah. And they're like, a year later, going, yeah, 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 but can, no, no. It's like, you know, when will this wedding ever end? <laughs> So I think that there's no question, thrilling in the beginning, and you just think, you know, it's all come great. And yeah. for me, I represent so many people who risked so much and gave so much to make it, so mm. I'm happy for them. Yeah. However, however, you never come down from that easily. And I go through what I call the methadone program mm. because you have to sort of debrief yourself back into yeah. feeling, and that's what you're talking about after that enormous wave with that yeah. Single. You, three years ago, were living in this city, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, kind of like going from squat to apartment oh, to couch to- yeah, yeah. To, and then, you know, you were headlining Madison Square Garden. Now, when you put it in a timeline like that, I think it should be acknowledged, it's a pretty incredible jump. Yeah, I think that's what's so scary about it though, you know what I mean? When you're like an 18 year old kid who's like, I, I wasn't speaking to my parents and like, you know, living with drug addicts and like, every artist goes kind of through that like you know this this romantic time of independence where you know you're you're choosing your art over your own sanity mm, and your own mm, safety mm, and like mm. you know i grew up reading patty smith you know what mm. i mean so like i that i needed to go through that mm -hmm, like you know mm -hmm. and it, it was definitely really dangerous at times but you know going from that to going to like madison square garden or it can be really scary because it's like well what do i do now mm. are you on good terms with your parents now yeah I am now. My parents are really young, mm. so, um, you know, f they were kind of like a lot of self-discovery and like, you know, I did things in a really like unorthodox way growing up and and I was kind of always like in my own head, you know what I mean? Like I think my parents probably felt like they didn't have much of a relationship with me mm. because I was like so behind my curtain mm. all the mm. time. Um, and I was like really social and stuff, but I was just like very, very much in my own head. And like I have a better relationship with them now because they've, you know, been inspired by my success. And, and they've got the records also. I mean, you're probably yeah. telling them things on the records that you couldn't tell them face to face. That's the beauty of art. You yeah, know? absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, send those messages. Mm -hmm. that's why I wrote the album too, though, is because I was going through this breakup and there was like mm. so much I couldn't say to the person, you know, and there's mm. like, you know, there's moments like on this on this record where I, I say some stuff, and like there's moments I was in the studio with him, cutting a vocal, and it was it was great because it was the only time he couldn't interrupt me. <laughs> I, had, I was recording, you know, so we were it wasn't a, it wasn't a fight, it wasn't an argument. Mm. It was I'm telling you this, and you're gonna sit down, and you're gonna listen because I'm gonna vocal. Have to use that technique. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's those moments too where I'm looking at him through the through the glass, and wow. he's at the mixing board, and wow. I'm in the booth singing like you wow. know. It's beautiful. Um, Sad, but. Beautiful. Um, mm. I get the message, you wish I was dead. Like yeah, moments like that, that it's lie. Yeah, no. um, you know, like moments where I'm saying things that I could never like say huh. in, in person. You don't love me any more than lie. Than lie. I'm sh and I'm shaking in the booth yeah. too, you know what I mean? Cause I'm, and I'm like, I'm trying to sing, but I'm also like really nervous. And then like, then there's like this whole awful thing where like you get out of the booth and you like, sit down on the chair and you're trying to be like civil and you're like, so how was that? <laughs> <laughs> was it good? All right, cool, I'll do it again. He turns around a silver chair and it's just like, I think it needs like an oboe in it or something. Yeah, like <laughs> I know. Um, and then, but then that's another thing too, is you're like, did you even get what I was saying. Yeah. I do even realize this is about you, but that's what I'm saying is like I definitely had to, in the way that you say like my parents maybe find like messages or like get to know me in a different way. Like I have human relationships like songs. So like I can have a human relationship for like three minutes and 40 seconds. Mm. Like I'm really bad at long-term relationships. Mm, mm, like mm. I, and like in the way that I like people can get to know me through like a three minutes record mm. or like an hour long record or whatever, I'm like the same way in real life. And then as soon as a human relationship kind of extends past like a day or mm -hmm. like a couple of days mm -hmm. or a couple of weeks, that's when I start to like malfunction. It's interesting you talk about like, you know, you, the relationship you have with relationships. <laughs> now you, you keep it in the family, mm. you know, so I know that, you know, you stay close to your family through this process and it's mm. collaborative, but, but it, how is that balance of being a dad and being a person and, and still being so dedicated to, you know, it's taking on a huge responsibility when you make a movie. It was difficult like this morning yeah. when I was coming up here. Yeah. I've always lived a kind of circus life and we've been a sort of circus family, but we're in some difficult moments of that at, at this point. Mm -hmm. But I think, just reflecting back on, on what you're talking about, mm -hmm. look, I think it's paradoxical. I think we are all, what, what you're going through, everything you've said this morning, is both 
amplified by the fact that you've got this great gift, which is you can express artistically mm. and people want to hear it, but on the same time, everyone's the same. Yeah. What, what, when it's at its best, is that everyone can relate to, oh, so you, you have to get up in the morning and you break up with your brother, and yeah. also you go like, you know, I'm not really getting on with my parents, they don't understand me at this point. Yeah. Like, those things are not specific to an artist. Yeah, they're, they're, you, they're so normal, yeah. mm. but you amplify it because yeah. you're medicating through mm, expressing a song or, yeah. you know, all that. So, to a certain extent, I look to myself now and go, well, how can the art, if the art is so consuming, there is no day, there is no night, it drives you. So how can I make sure it's actually making sense of life? And mm. I'm right in the middle of that right now. Yeah. Mm. It yeah. Does, it's not easy and it doesn't always work. Yeah. I think it's a perpetual battle too because you, you have something that happens in your life that's so meaningful to you that you want to make it into art. And then you dedicate so much of your time making it into art and you spend so much time doing that that you don't have time to live life to make that's more the, art. That's, that's, the, the, that's the vicious the, cycle. It, and by the way, I might be slightly on the older side, <laughs> but I know even older artists that you all know, the world knows, great iconic artists, and it never changes. Never ends, yeah. wow. It never changes. The way you deal with it and the art that comes out of it does. Yeah. And I, I won't go into who, but I just ran into someone who was very iconic and then they've changed their life and I see them working again. Like they've sort of stopped and now they're, what, the work that's going to come I know is going to be good because mm -hmm. mm. they've gone, all right, I just can't keep chasing that hip, mm. keeping that thing going. Mm. Can I ask you a question, you both of you? Do you guys think that artists and artistic people are inherently, like, very, are inherently these kind of, like, dramatic alarmists? Like, do you think it's an art artist quality to feel like everything's the end of the world? Or, like, everything is the greatest <laughs> thing in the world? Like, because if you didn't see it that way, then you yeah. wouldn't feel yeah, like... You'd be part-time, you'd be tourist. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, it's a dangerous, slightly dangerous world art artist, you know, because, like, just in its most practical sense, it just really means in the dictionary someone who does yeah. things really, really well. So, <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then you get that thing where it can be loaded sometimes, meaning those creatives who make things that are worthy and then it becomes well, what's worthy, right? Yeah. So if you take that, as, put that aside though, what I totally agree about is that whoever bothers to finally make anything, be it a story or a piece of music or expression on, I mean, they're doing the get down at the moment, which by the way was my kind of reboot experience, like yeah. my step outside my comfort zone, what are you thinking? You know, two years of that extraordinary experience, I, I never in a million years thought I would go on that journey. I was so privileged, so in every regard. Mm. But the journey of that is that, and I think the bottom line is, is that the yes of it is. Not everyone's going to maybe feel it yeah. in the high-low way that you do yeah. or express it, but everyone's bothered by something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it definitely comes from a feeling of wanting to be feel high and low, of yeah. intense internal emotion, yeah. no question. You know, it's funny because you've both directed, like you've, you've directed this album. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really your overall vision. You didn't go to these producers and say, I need you to go make this for me. You said, yeah. I need you to help get this out. Who was the one that pushed you the most on this record? Benny Blanco definitely, uh -huh. definitely pushed me because mm -hmm. he's so, f he's formulamatic, but he's also like has no rules. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like him as a person, he just does whatever he wants he's the coolest person I've ever met in my yeah, whole life yeah. he's just brilliant and so pure and like so loving and like we we hit it off right away and like um he's you know it was really therapeutic working with him because he's no nonsense like he'll be like you know I'll be singing I'll be like singing a song I'll be cutting a vocal and I'll be singing about like this heartbreaking <laughs> experience with this guy and then I'll finish it and he'll be like that was a great take you have to get over it like you know what I mean or, like he'll be like that was a great take he cheated on you he was kind of like telling me like, I know you're exercising these demons, but at the same time as your friend, mm. like leave it in the studio. Mm -hmm. Leave it in the studio and walk away from it. Like, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. put it here and mm -hmm. then like don't carry it mm -hmm. with you kind of thing. But also just like from a professional standpoint, like he was having me make choices like the eyes closed. I had been, I had had a much bigger voice on this record. I was like really determined to like sing because my voice is really contained on Badlands. Then I played 300 shows and your voice is a muscle. So it mm, grows, you learn mm. new things, you get more familiar with yourself. You know, so I was really determined to have this like big, powerful, confident, vibrant voice. And then on this one song in particular, he kept pushing me to do this like airy, soft, like vulnerable, like vocal. 
And at first, you know, I was like so in my own head, and I was like, no, this album is confident, this album is mm -hmm. vibrant, this mm -hmm. album is vindicated and mm -hmm. angry, and like, that's not gonna work here, that's not gonna work here. And he kept pushing me along to try this like airy, like verbed mm -hmm. out vocal, mm -hmm. and it was brilliant. Mm. It's interesting to me because we don't get a, a, a male protagonist um, that's until, until lies. Yeah. And it's Quavo. And he's also a third party because he's not the guy I'm singing about. He's the guy telling the guy I'm singing about that he should have treated me better. Okay, good. But there's moments on the record where I kind of really dive into this like Shakespearean formula where like the prologue and Good Morning and Hopeless uh -huh. have those kind of like choir vocals, uh -huh. which is quite literally supposed to represent a choir. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like a, a, narr a narration, which mm -hmm. is why cool. the record. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give too much away. Never mind. Mm -hmm. And um, these these third party characters all are kind of representing, um, you know, representing uh, you know like uh, secondary characters outside of outside of me or outside of of my Juliet character, who's actually Romeo, but is Juliet because I gender swapped them. But that's you like sure whole, did. You I see that in the that. videos. Yeah. It's like a whole other yeah. thing. Um, but I, you know what? The reason for that is because, and that was that was a lot. That's largely due to how compelling Leo's performance is, mm -hmm. and your. Mm. I, I identified with him more than her. Mm -hmm. I was this. I in that moment writing this record, mm. I was this kind of like whiny, pining, sure. like you know, hopeless romantic you know, for the pursuit of love, but like still like aggressive, mm -hmm. like filled with this kind of like this 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 coming out of the dawn of like what was like a teen angst for mm -hmm, me now mm -hmm. that I'm in my 20s mm -hmm. but I dated this guy when I was 19 and on you know so it's like coming out of this teen angst into this more like adult like I just I was him every time mm -hmm. I watched the movie I was mm -hmm. him I wasn't mm -hmm. anyone else you know mm -hmm. so that's why I had to flip the characters but I'm really glad you did I'm really glad you did because mm -hmm. I think that there's, there's actually sort of three or four things on this record that again you've never been shy of acknowledging in your movies, mm -hmm. which I think you've really attacked head on. Um, one is the fact that you know you've you've created the the, the the main protagonist as a female lead. Yeah. The other is race. You've always mm -hmm. been very very open to addressing mm -hmm. race in mm -hmm. your movies. Yeah. And you've gone straight in there. I mean, this is effectively yeah. the characters. A, it's a, it's interracial. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, also it's interesting the way that it's reflective in the in the perception of like light and dark as good and bad because I'm half black and I'm That's white right. passing mm -hmm. and Don Lee is obviously like a, is a light skinned black a young light skinned black man in the videos and so that was me kind of embrace embracing myself as kind of like a bit of a more masculine like a, ma a more like masculine type like female character and mm -hmm. culture right now and he mm -hmm. was so beautiful mm. I saw him I knew he was Juliet mm. immediately because he was just so beautiful and so and so like kind and soft and unassuming mm -hmm. and so what we've done in almost every element of this record is a gender swap like my mm -hmm. album cover he's mm. on it but he's mm. a prop mm. in mm. the same way that when like a, a, a male led group or like a, mm. a rapper or a rock star or whoever, when they do an album cover on there, there's a female body. She means nothing. She's just mm -hmm. part of the story. And you know, even in like the way we chose to like set up some of the shots, like he's always beneath me. Mm -hmm. He's like six foot five <laughs> in real life. But like, you know, when we're laying in the bed, like I kind of have this, like my arm around him and his head's mm. down here. Mm. And like, you know, it's, I'm in this very like, controlling dominant position in the relationship and so um you know and that's how it felt in the real relationship too you know what i mean mm. because like i'm in this position of like success in this position of control in this position of dominance and there's a lot of that in this record too where i'm like in these positions of control and like i don't want them i'm with this person who's like kind of submissive and like whatever and i'm just wishing that they'd take but control plays a huge part of this record and you yourself said that you struggle in relationships yes. because you have to control the, in the the entrance and control the exit i think that's also a lot of the reason why we went down a romeo and juliet path is because you know they're fighting for control of their relationship and there's these greater forces working against them you know what I mean? And those forces are, you know, wanting control. And the whole, the whole, the whole story is just about people wanting to take control of each other and wanting to have everything go their mm. way, it's the a, right way, mm. you know? I mean, one of the things about, interesting what you say, because one of the things that's universal about the Romeo and Juliet story, as much as it's about those young characters, it's mu it was written by Shakespeare as a cautionary tale mm -hmm. to the adult world <clears throat> and saying, if you, the incumbent generation, hand on a world of hatred, mm -hmm. of continuing conflict, of abuse of the world and the environment around you, mm -hmm. you are gonna end up with tragedy on your hands yeah. with those that you love the most, your children. And what that's about is, 
this idea that, and, and is any wonder it's incredibly resonant right now, yeah. because the incumbent generation of which I'm part of mm. hasn't done a very good job mm. of the world they're handing on. It's yeah. a beautiful opportunity to talk about one of the best songs on the record, um, which you know is, is called Strangers, which is mm. you, know, you and Lauren from Fifth Harmony singing. Yeah. And uh, both of you have come out and, 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 and said, you know, as far as your sexuality is concerned, that you're both bisexual and you have this love song between yeah. the two of you, which is just outrageously that was good. A ballsy, ballsy really? thing. But why? For me, it was, a it was a female thing because, like, I, you know, I adore Sam Smith, I adore Troy Sivan, I love, I think that the male representation in the LGBT community and pop mm -hmm. music right now is like, you know, it's kind of come a long way. Mm -hmm. But, there's not a, whole, a lot of female representation in that way. I have never heard a song, and I may be wrong, but like hmm. of two openly, you know, LGBT women singing a song, a love song to each other on Top 40 Radio. Mm. Like that's, and you know, that's crazy to me. And but but also like when I decided to put Lauren on it, because I wrote the song myself with Greg on piano, Greg mm. Kirsten. Mm. I knocked the song out in like a really short amount of time because I was kind of going through this weird thing and like, you know, revisiting this old relationship and it's, you know, but just also thinking about my role um, in relationships that had turned mostly physical. Mm. You know what I mm. mean? Like relationships where there used to be an emotional connection and now mm -hmm. they've turned mostly physical. Um, and I just wanted to see, I wanted to see what it would sound like if Pat Benatar mm. and Stevie Nicks wrote a love song. <laughs> Brilliant. Also, like to take a girl from a pop band, like a pop female, all female pop group, and you know, to make this record, that's like subversive in itself. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's, but that's why I chose the features that I did. I have Quavo, Lauren, and Cashmere Cat, and mm -hmm. the reasoning for that is because I think that they represent three flavors of the album. There's mm -hmm. like this electronic element, which mm -hmm. is like the cashmere, you know, feature. And then there's this pop element, which is the Lauren feature. And then there's kind of like this urban element, which is Quavo. Mm. Um, but Quavo sounding, mm. I mean, Sounding like he's, he's been, you pushed him into an emotional environment. Emotional Quavo. Yeah, totally. Emo Quavo. Like I know, like Quavo's <laughs> the king of flow right now. Okay, yeah. Quavo's inventing new flows for rappers every single week yeah. and then literally handing them to them through song. Yeah. It's like, go and, go and use that flow and I'll come up with another one. So yeah. we know that the guy on the mic is like one of the most subversively like dominant rappers in the game yeah. right now, right? Like That's he's just put, remarkable. But you put him on this track. I know, instead of the, instead a, of the club banger. Yeah, yeah. It was a weird choice. It's like being no, it's like, cool. you know, how can I use it? it this isn't, I always talk about Kanye West literally all the time. But for me, it was like, how would Kanye use him? You know what I mean? Like, I would want, I want to put him in an uncomfortable space. You know what I mean? Where, like, I'm literally doing the Kendrick style verse in the beginning of yeah. the song, and then he comes in and does this, like, melodic emo, like, whatever. Um, this, like, emotional, heart wrenching Quavo moment. And so for me, it was like, how can I use him in a way that is instead of, the, is not the easy way out? Because the easy way out would be to take him, put him on a pop hit. Migos is huge right now mm. for dominating mm. streaming and radio mm. and be like, all right, well, there you go. Like, here's me. No, it's great. Pausing Migos. Like, you know, I didn't want to do that. No, it's great. And, it, and it's, it's in keeping with the theme of the record. Um, I need to ask you a couple of questions about this record. But I need to, what's the weekend's involvement in this? Abel and I obviously have known each other for a while. We did, we had toured with him um, like a year or so, a year and a half ago. Mm. And, um, He's obviously been a huge influence of mine. He's probably one of the only artists that I can truly say, um, like modern artists that I can truly say has like an influence on my, on my music. Because he's changed the shape of pop music. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the Hills sure. changed the shape yeah. of pop music. Right. He does whatever he wants. The song is dark and raw, and lyrically mm. on the nose is that. Yeah. yeah. Can be like number one for that long. It's well, just crazy. For me out here trying to make my like you know dark pop yeah. records, I'm yeah. like wow. You, you can, can do, do that, it. you know what I mean? So yeah. that's really, really cool. And there's always kind of been those comparisons in a weird way, like when I was first coming up, like of me as kind of like this like female like version mm. of of him, despite how so like sonically different our stuff can be, but really isn't when you get down to it. But one of the big influences for me was Kissland. For me, it was kind of like this sonic influence where he was using such unique sounds and he was using such environmental sounds. He was creating this landscape. Like I get this vision of him overseas in Asia touring and like being scared and like, you know, the women and the drugs and the police and like mm, all this stuff, mm. this kind of like mentality of him coming up in this like dark world of fame that's like mm, rotating around mm. him and in this darkness, like I just got it. I just got it. I was like, I get it. So what did he do on the record, did he? I was in the studio with Benny and we were kind of like going through some tracks that he had made and he opened up a track that he thought was an instrumental and didn't realize that it had some ad libs over it. Mm. And it opens up in the studio and it's able like um, going, 
You know what I mean? It's like, which is a very weekend melody. Yeah, no words, just Nothing, looking, just looking for the inflection in the melody. And yep. The, yep, just ad libs, just humming. And so he gets this one part, and it's like, so and I thought he said eyes closed. And that's how a lot of songwriting happens, is you ad lib and the sounds create yeah, the story yeah, themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I thought he said eyes closed, and I was like, wait a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, I have a song. Um, and you know, Abel was like really, when he, when he was, it was, it was, it was a, Melody he was working on when he was doing Starboy, mm -hmm. and um, one that him and Benny actually talked about potentially wanting to give to me. But at the time, I wasn't taking pitches. I was I didn't want songs from anyone. Mm -hmm. I was doing everything myself. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of really organic that this record came up in the studio session, and I heard it and like had this whole idea. So I wrote a poem over his melody, and so it was like a really traditional and really amazing kind of marriage of two songwriters because he contributed melody, I contributed lyric, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then we married this, you know, we made this 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 song together. I would have loved to have him on it. No, I think it's cooler it's so, because yeah, it's cooler. Yeah. Because it's not about him. It's, no, it's It exactly. was in the same way you were, mm. Bez influenced you with his work. Mm -hmm. mm. Abel did w without even realizing it. Yeah. He created something that, that captures something in you yeah. that it doesn't, it's not like, okay, now we have a weekend feature. Yeah, but that's why it's so special to have him involved though, mm. you know what I mean? It's like I got so lucky mm -hmm. getting to have like all my influences like and see just pop well. their head in. Oh, and Sia's like, you know, she's the reason I write music. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. <laughs> I was, we all know what a monster she is. She's a, she's a music Unreal. machine. Unreal. <laughs> I, was, I was like in high school, I must have been a senior in high school and I was on Tumblr mm -hmm. and I was like scrolling through Tumblr and I came across this video of Sia at some like convention. It might have been like a BMI ASCAP convention or something like a war ceremony yeah. and she's singing Diamonds. Right, like and I was like, wow, she's covering I was thinking, look at this video of Sia covering diamonds. Covering diamonds. And then I look in the description <laughs> and it's like Sia performing the song she, she wrote. wrote for Rihanna. And yeah. I went, my brain exploded. Because yeah. until that moment, I just thought everybody wrote their own music. That was such a poignant moment for me because it was when everything clicked. I was like, oh my God. Like not only can I write songs, not only is it sick if I write songs for myself, but I can write songs for other people, mm -hmm. which I've just started doing now that you know, Hope Sign Kingdom is finished, I just started writing for other people, which is like a really weird thing. That's it's be like being a director, yeah, kind of. Yeah, but that's yeah. gonna be weird because if you've been in a situation where you've been able to control your vision for so long, now you're gonna have to collaborate I know. on someone else's vision. It's fun for me though, because it's exciting and it's still science and it's yeah. still craft and it's still an exercise. Are you doing it now? Have you been doing it now? Yeah, I've Who you been working with? Um, most of the time I've been writing with Greg for some other like female, female performers. Yeah. Because um, Greg and I have such a synergy. Oh my gosh, he's like, yeah. he writes in the most like, it, writing with him, I feel timeless. I have no idea what decade I'm in when I'm writing with him because mm. it's just me and him at a piano. Who would you love to write for? Who's the dream? Uh, Manifest destiny, visualization of Rihanna. epic proportions, Rihanna. Yeah, I would love, for, if she sang something I wrote, I would retire. You have a concept record that's been inspired by this man's work. And I know that you want to see this vision through completely. Yeah. But it would be foolish of me not to suggest or at least ask whether or not this collaboration that you've had unwittingly could be formalized. We've seen mm. great experience where amazing artists, I guess Devlin, work with incredible artists like Kanye West. Yeah. And I wonder whether, even with your vision already probably mapped out for this, there's an opportunity for you two to actually collaborate, even on this project at some, some capacity. I have a feeling that Baz and I are going to link up at some point creatively. For something. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I'm wasting my time here. <laughs> <laughs> so you told me I'd get a gig. <laughs> How about this? How about an outsider comes in from left of field and makes a quick suggestion that just came to mind? So you're going to go on, on tour and you're yeah. going to see your vision through. You have things that you have to complete and get done. Yep, I'm going to, yes. And then I'm going to retire, I think. But yeah. You're you not. could put on, I mean, our I haircut's quite similar. You could put on the outfit and go tour for me. So you, you're working hard, you're working yeah. hard. It's I think we're going to end up doing something. I got an idea. Okay. So, so right. at some point, at some point, this, this tour will lead you to, to um, you'll, you'll do, I guess, the things that, are established and, and will be successful. You'll do festivals and you'll do your own mm -hmm. shows and end up in arenas and we'll do arenas and it's already established. But, but you know, a bowl or an amphitheater or somewhere special or maybe three shows or something to mm. put it to an end yeah, where, actually, where there's actually mm. an aesthetic collaboration yeah. where some set design, some kind of design oh, work meets staging oh. and things like that and we can see the completion of this project hmm. in the collaboration comes full circle. Just throwing that out there. I paid him to ask you so I wouldn't have to. How long does a tour take? How long will that be? You don't know yet, do you? They At least a year, right? They take a long time. Um, they go on and off. About, right? about a year, yeah. About a year, right? They go on and off. But what happens? 
my observation is, and this is where I do these little pieces, is that opportunities come up that are really unique and unusual, unexpected, you know, mm -hmm. adventures, where there's not all that, like, I can't make room in my creative life or you in your mm -hmm. life and you've got your team right now, but what is natural and organic is something will come up and go like, wouldn't it be good if just for the sake of doing that? Yeah. You know? So that's... Wouldn't it be? I would yeah, be I'll entirely... I mean, I'm already open to that. I'm excited by it too. I've really enjoyed this. I was looking forward to it from the second that it came up as a possibility, you know, because I've always wanted to meet you as a fan. And you know I'm a fan of you and ongoing through this record, especially having heard the record and realizing what an incredibly brave and brilliant body of work it is. Mm -hmm. So, however, you guys have influenced each other and brought us all together, all of us, has been a real joy. So thanks for the opportunity, man. We appreciate it. 